according to T-Dub and the Spice Girls, the Australian car market currently has 49 different brands competing for your cold, hard cash. But should you find yourself parked outside one of the following 20, salivating perhaps in the manner of Pavlov's dog, my strong advice would be run, dude, and don't look back. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, <coughs> yes, Lee. Or you can just click the card that's, you know, as usual, up there now, dude. Sporty, scary, baby posh and ginger all agree that that is by far the best place for it. And I trust them more than I trust politicians and car company CEOs. That's for sure. This video is sponsored by Olight. And look, plain talk, okay? If you've got one of those 10 year old torches in the car, which is like one candle bright on its best day ever and always flat and you need to keep feeding it friggin' batteries and it's generally as dodgy as hell, it's high time that you saw the light, literally. Because a lot has happened in torches over recent years. There's a big Olight sale tonight at 8 p.m. There's links and a code for 12% off for items outside the sale in the description. And two of my all-time favorite tactical torches, just there, dude, in limited edition colors, <laughs> will be on sale with up to 40% off. And who doesn't want that? I'd suggest if there is a zombie apocalypse following the fires, the pandemic, the floods and the federal election, and this does seem to be where things are heading, if that happens and you're out after dark and not packing an Olight, that's on you, dude. Buying a car is, in a sense, seduction. The objective is for you to fall in lust, right? Because it's easy to overlook the obvious flaws in this besotted state. All the blood is, you know, heading south, isn't it? Brain imminently to go offline kind of thing. Golf Type R, C63 AMG, Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT, maybe even a Polestar 2 and glide off silently to electric utopia perhaps. They are all quite sexy in the right light after a few drinks, but also quite a bad idea, objectively, I'd suggest. The easiest way for you to get together a short list of cars with which you can cohabitate long term without them going all Glen Close from Fatal Attraction is simply for you to eliminate the dud brands and Doing that is dead easy. We'll do it now. Because no matter how TP'd up you appear to be in the trouser department over whatever, a golf R, for example, if you walk down the aisle with that gorgeous shit heap, you'll have Volkswagen for in-laws, dude. They will be an intrinsic part of your relationship. And trust me when I say you really don't deserve that. The distinction between these three evil brands is really quite simple. Audi is the pig in lipstick of the Volkswagen stable, which targets affluent chronic <coughs> stabators. And Skoda is the anti-kudos version of essentially the same thing with the same penchant for simple harmonic motion. Audi and Skoda's sales have tanked in Australia this year and Skoda's, let's be frank, were never anywhere anyway. Volkswagen in its own right is also down 33% year on year, so that's an advertisement for consistency. And I guess even if you can forgive them for amusingly, illegally, criminally attempting to poison the world back in 2015, and I can't because they were abjectly felonious conspiratorial bastards on that one, but if you can, 
their commitment to throwing you under the bus when they should in fact be supporting you following a fault in your Wolfsburgian shitbox, that is truly amazing. Thus, the universe is bifurcated neatly into two camps of Volkswagen owners. Camp number one, they're still in love because nothing's gone wrong yet. Still enamoured of the stylish sexiness and the taut dynamics. And who doesn't like that? I mean, I know I do. Camp number two, numerically smaller but significant. Those who've had a real problem and for whom the, uh, well, let's call it uh, Volkswagen customer care apparatus has thrown them under the next double-decker to Piccadilly friggin' circus. A process which has squeezed out their souls and left them withered husks. Ever since the Pinto, Ford has established its true position on the design excellence spectrum. The power shit transmission pretty much confirmed the company's consistency in this regard, and that was a much more recent triumph, obviously. Backed by the same level of customer care exemplified by Volkswagen, and the sheer automotive engineering excellence of everything American, Ford in Australia is just one vehicle away from doing a Holden and disappearing up its own anus. And that vehicle is the Ranger. I mean, Amarok, Amaranger, whatever. Seriously, dude, Fords are badly engineered and the customer service is even worse. My very good friends at 3 Pro. well, in my view, they're trading on a reputation that's essentially four decades out of date. Harking back to when owning a Mercedes-Benz meant spending roughly half the national debt. But at least if you did, you really did end up driving the pinnacle of automotive engineering excellence. Today, however, Mercedes' attitude is more or less that we will graciously take your despicably filthy and highly unworthy money... And in exchange, we will graciously allow you to bask behind our glorious badge. You're very lucky. Also, we've boned our dealers, who are currently suing us for 650 million bucks, over the barbed wire enema which we gave them, allegedly, which kind of shows the world exactly how we value anyone in a commercial relationship with us. That's not like a huge red flag or anything, is it? Also, our sales have tanked, mainly thanks to our shit price promise, which means we no longer discount our cars. And how were we to know that this would be such a free kick for BMW? Like, dude, that was so unexpected. And we'll give Volkswagen a run for its money in the shit service sweepstakes any day of the week, ending in Y. Try us and find all this out, hilariously, for yourself. Seriously, dude, if you want a Merc, just buy a BMW or a Lexus. Just as nice, half the pain. This report is sponsored by Olight. And as you know by now, I don't accept sponsorships from brands that I don't believe in. I actually carry an Olight Warrior Mini 2 in my pocket everywhere, and if I've got a bag with me, there's probably a Warrior 3 in it. These two are hands down my two favorite torches. This is the Mini 2. The tail switch is just awesome for tactical use, like under pressure, when you need light, if you don't have fine motor control, your thumb just goes there, you get two intensities, bright, okay, and lightsaber. And the side switch for finer beam adjustment is brilliant also, okay? Plus they're water and shock resistant, so they're hard to kill, that's for sure. And they're rechargeable with an awesome magnetic USB arrangement. Like, Olight's big thing is magnets and they work really well. Mother's Day's coming up too, just saying. Mum's always wanted a tactical torch and you've always wanted to remain in the will. 
admit it. I'd also suggest that if you are still using a Kmart torch from the 12th century or something and you're feeding it batteries endlessly, you need not suffer any longer in this outdated way. Warrior Mini 2 in that cool copper colour and the Warrior 3S in black or gunmetal, that's the gunmetal one just there, both of them are up to 40% off from 8pm tonight, that's the 24th of April, until midnight on the 28th, so that's a great deal. If you missed the sale because you didn't subscribe and bother to hit the bell, there's a code for 12% off in the description, plus links to the torches also. I don't get attacked by zombies all that often anymore, frankly. Except, of course, in the comments. But I need to see in the dark all the time. At night time, or even in the daytime here in the Fat Cave, when I drop something small under the bench, etc. Happens all the time. And way back in engineering school, if memory serves, they taught us that the cure for dark is to add light, which is also in the Bible, incidentally. It's the whole reason God whispered Maxwell's equations for the very first time, just a few nanoseconds after the Big Bang. Look it up, dude. Link to the Olight sale in the description. Owning a Jeep is like having a foursome of sorts where the other three participants are crap reliability, extortionate repair costs, and that elite don't give a shit non-commitment to solving your vehicle's problems. So, I want to love Jeep because of the icon factor. I really do. I, I drove the Rubicon Trail in a Wrangler, and that was awesome. I also want to love Jeep because when it hasn't gone poopy in its trousers, the Jeep Grand Cherokee is so damn impressive and such good value, so capable. But the risks here simply outweigh the fantasy. Here in Australia, word has finally got around on Jeep. Sales have essentially flatlined. It has to be an unsustainable business model commercially. The brand is a dead man walking today, seemingly. They could easily just pack up and pee off. Kind of like our next don't buy brand. Remember in the 1990s when Honda was the BMW of the land of the rising sun, the inventor of VTEC, challenging the Prius to become the Coca-Cola of hybridization. They were awesome days. Honda was gloriously on the front foot back then. Well, how the mighty have fallen, right? Two plus decades of abject failures to innovate, stagnating mainstream products, financial loss after loss, here in Australia with tanking sales to match. So in response to this cavalcade of cataclysms, Honda Australia recently boned its dealers in the manner of three prong. Prices skyrocketed, the product range got slashed, sales got even worse. They're 40% down so far this year, ballpark. And that is off the back of a 40% reduction in 2021 and a 34% reduction in 2020. Honda Australia's sales for the past three years track the approximate short final landing trajectory of the Hindenburg back on the 6th of May, 1937. Remember that. The biggest risk with buying a Honda today is that the brand simply will not exist here in Australia in two years' time or something. They could easily do a Holden at any moment I'm told by an insider that they're selling assets in Australia and repatriating the funds to Japan right now, which I've been unable to confirm, but it hardly inspires confidence and it's not outside the realms of possibility, is it? And I do know that the ACCC is suing Honda Australia, allegedly for misleading customers about the nature of the closure of its dealerships recently. Honda is simply too shaky for you to sleep with at present, at least in my view. That legendary truck-like reliability. <laughs> yes. 
Dude, the number of complaints I get from DMAX owners concerning don't give a shit factor when they front at a dealership with a problem is grossly disproportionate to the number of Isuzu Utes actually rolling out there on our roads. Bottom line, I think Isuzu Ute has a serious deep-seated service culture problem in this country. I'm lumping these brands together for a reason, which will hopefully become obvious in just a sec. And I get the appeal. Polestar is essentially just electric Volvo, and it's got a head office in Gothenburg, which legitimizes its Euro chicness. But the factory is in China. No getting around that. They've got no dealerships in this country either. Plenty of cars are on shore here, seemingly, but they just can't seem to deliver them. Go figure. Like, hey, we thought handing them over in the local RSL car park would be dead easy, but it's not that simple. Who knew? As for servicing these vehicles and solving operational faults in service, Christ only knows how they're going to manage that. Just before the GFC, okay, bit of a history lesson, Volvo, Land Rover and Jaguar were all owned by Ford. And then one day the accountants called up and Ford had to have this big fire sale to avoid bankruptcy in the manner of GM and Chrysler, which had just both gone chapter 11 tits up kind of thing. The Brits got sold to the Indians in a neatly sort of anti-Raj twist and Volvo went to the Chinese. And they were all crap at reliability before Ford acquired them. But Ford managed to make them even worse, amazingly. And the new owners have not yet apparently been able to write that particular ship. Here in Shitsville, they remain also emphatically crap at customer service. Some would say outright bastards and I would be one of them. To discover the depth of bastardry actually on offer here, should you marry into this particular family, which I so don't recommend, Google the term Sally Morphy, M-O-R-P-H-Y, Range Rover. Sally Morphy Range Rover. Dude, sometimes love don't feel like it should. They make it hurt so good. Suzuki and Nissan are almost, but not quite, Honda. But they think they're Toyota, disconcertingly, and they're bad at customer service. They've got stagnating products with no real innovation. It's just not a reason to buy one of these over, say, Toyota, Subaru or Mitsubishi if you want mainstream Japanese with good R&D, decent tech and reasonable customer service. Together with Honda, it's like the pair just went into the ice during the GFC and they've never really thawed out. Seven concluding rats and mice here. More rat than mouse, however, if you ask me in each case. Three Chinese, one South Korean, and three from the red wine drinking cheese eaters, just for completeness. Dude, the appeal here is simply they're cheap, in the case of MG, LDV, GWM and Sanyong, or Euro chic and cheap in the case of the French. Mercedes on a budget sort of thing, whatever. So the nouveau cheapies from Asia are a real roll of the dice in my view, and this makes you a lab rat in the can we swim commercially experiment, Australia. LDV has already been to court here and lost because they alleged it was an owner's fault that his shitbox T60 rusted out. I mean, after all, he had the gall to work near the beach. The dumb SOB. What's up for grabs here, obviously, is quality, reliability, support and resale value. GWM and Sanyong have been here for quite a while, but they've had several, let's be generous and call them lacklustre at best, attempts to get this right in Australia, especially Sanyong, which is technically still bankrupt, I think. 
And if you think that buying a car from a bankrupt car maker is a way to derive customer support excellence in coming years, perhaps we can agree respectfully to disagree on that one. Renault, Citroën and Peugeot comprise the sideshow alley of Euro mainstream vehicles available down under. They're hardly renowned for reliability and certainly not very popular. And this matters, okay? The thing all of these vehicles, the cheapies and the French, have in common is, obviously, that they don't sell in sufficient numbers to represent a good idea for you if you are simply a mainstream car buyer there are very important low volume commercial realities for you to consider in the buying equation. At least if I was setting one up for you, I'd tell you to look hard at this. And first up, that is, it's a hell of a long way between dealerships, isn't it? If you buy one of these low volume brands, that makes it very hard for you to shop around. That would be to shop around for the vehicle itself when you are buying it, as well as for parts and service, once you have become an owner, especially in regional Australia. Plus, most dealers are multi-franchised, so perhaps, let's say, you're at a dealer who sells Toyota, Hyundai, BMW, and LDV, okay? LDV probably accounts for something like 2% of the profit for the dealer group, and that's pretty much going to sum up the dealer's investment in the parts inventory and technical training for the brand. And that means if you buy a Hilux and it's got a problem, it's going to be distinctly easier to solve because more people will be trained and probably also a lot less of a wait for the parts compared with the equivalent problem in an LDV T60. That's just how this works. I guess what I'm saying in this report is it's okay to buy a new car in part with your heart. But if you don't also engage your head and give it at least equal airtime, you really do open the door to some kind of abject disaster that is long lasting and quite difficult, not to mention expensive, to get out of. Like, in a sense, you're at a casino and you're rolling the dice. And of course, it is possible to buy a Jeep, a Merc or a Volkswagen, etc. and love it from day one until trade-in, provided nothing goes wrong, and if it does, provided you get looked after. (coughs) Unlikely. And if this is the path that you ultimately decide to tread, it's up to you, dude. It's your money, and I sincerely hope you have a good experience. But in my view, if you do this, you are simply playing Russian roulette, and way too many of those chambers are fully loaded.